everybody. This is Aaron Good. You're listening to the American Exception Podcast. In this episode, I'm joined by Daniel Bessner, co-host of the American Prestige Podcast. He is a professor in the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington. Some of you may remember that we've talked about Scoop Jackson in past episodes. He's known as one of the founding fathers of neoconservatism, and back in his time, he was often referred to as the senator from Boeing. Kind of funny, I guess, that he has a school named after him at a major public university, but that's how it goes. Uh, Anyway, I digress. Daniel Bessner is also a non-resident fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft and a contributing editor at Jacobin. In 2019 and 2020, he served as a foreign policy advisor to Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign. Daniel is an intellectual historian of U.S. foreign relations and the author of Democracy in Exile, Hans Speer, and the Rise of the Defense Intellectual. Stay tuned after the interview because we also have a discussion on materialism, ideology, and propaganda with our man in Boston, Ben Howard. But first, here's our discussion with Daniel Bessner. Daniel Bessner, it's good to be here with you today. How you doing? Hey, Aaron, I'm good, man. I just had a great week on Twitter, so <laughs> just riding high. <laughs> awesome. So, yeah, let's talk about Twitter because Twitter is a place where something pops in your head and you can quickly post it and see the response. And you posted a, a tweet which raised some eyebrows, including mine, I guess. And uh, I'll read it here. It was, my one message to the world, propaganda very rarely works. People are not that stupid. And if it works, it's usually a function of material reasons. So I would, I think that I I personally would attribute a lot of our political problems to the catastrophic success of propaganda. Uh, And and so in that, and I would say that it is effective, but why do you think that, that we, that it doesn't really work that often? So I think we should probably start, you know, we're both PhDs. Let's start with defining our categories. Um, So there's, political communication in every society at all moments in history. And political communication is necessarily informed by ideology, the way one understands the world, the way one frames the world, the way one basically structures the miasma of human experiences and information that come into their mind. Um, And I think political communication is always informed by ideology. And so then the question becomes is when does political communication transform into this thing that we call propaganda? So what I think is that on the contemporary American left, which is the one with which I'm most familiar uh, and with uh, is the one that I think, you know, the the leftists who mostly got mad were based in the United States, maybe not totally, but it seemed to be quite a bit, um, is that propaganda has by 2022 come to be understood as defining any form of political communication, any form of political communication that contains an ideological that contains ideological content, which I would say is all forms of political communication. Now, why do I think that is? I think in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, propaganda had a more specific term. And and in particular, it was often used by American policymakers to refer to what the Soviet Union or to what Cuba or to what other countries did. They would say, we're telling the truth and you are propagandizing, right? You are, you are not telling the truth. You are lying. The American state would claim incorrectly it was itself lying, uh, that it was always telling the truth, and it would say that, no, you Soviets are always lying. I think what happened in the 1980s is that in a reaction to this use of propaganda, left-wing anti-imperialist critics basically reacted by saying, no, aha, you, you U.S. decision makers, you are the ones who are actually doing propaganda. Um, You're saying other people are doing it and you're claiming that you're abiding by what was called um, for much of uh, the 20th century, the strategy of truth. But in actuality, you're you yourself are telling lies and and you could see it in the various operations of all political communication in society. So I think in the last, you know, 30, 35 plus years, um, propaganda has commonsensically become known on the left as to refer to all types of political communication that contain ideological content. Um, So why do I actually think it's important and why do I not just think this is a debate about tenses? I think there is also, um, and Aaron, I think this, this 
sort of strikes directly at what you're interested in. So pay, uh, you know, th this is the one that you should really pay attention to. I think that there's this false belief on the American left that the exposure of nefarious doings or the exposure of um, particular conspiracies in the past will actually engender political change. Essentially, the exposure of all political communication as, as quote unquote propaganda, many on the left believe, will somehow impel change. Um, I think, ironically, this is actually a liberal understanding of political communication, something akin to what Habermas proposed. Um, and I define Habermas as a liberal, uh, essentially arguing that rational exchange, the exposure of ideas, are mean is a meaningful way to change politics. And therefore, you know, referring, you know, pulling the getting the, the sunglasses off everyone's face, you know, pulling the wool out from their eyes by exposing everything of propaganda, I think people believe will engender political change. So I actually think it's a harder problem to identify political communication as not necessarily being quote unquote propaganda, but as being ideologically informed content that is actually much more difficult to overcome than propaganda that just, you know, lies to you or tells you fixed uh, or, or messes facts around or, you know, screws with what you're saying. So that's my basic why I think it's actually important to distinguish between propaganda and political communication that is ideological. Because I think if we don't, we will misunderstand the nature of political change and we actually misunderstand the nature of political communication in a society. So that's basically the whole argument. And then, you know, so it might not be worth it to, to, to argue over like, this is propaganda, that's not propaganda, but that's sort of like the holistic claim behind that tweet. Okay. So um, I guess I would start with a, with a different chronology of the term propaganda and where it came to have its connotation, which it definitely is one of those terms that has a connotation that's different than the definition that academics would ascribe to it. So um, propaganda definition, like the term actually comes from the like 1500s or so that the church had an institution uh, that decided to go out and spread the word, spread the, the, uh, the, the faith around. And it was, they had the term propaganda in it, uh, in this actual, you know, part of the church. And the idea for them, they were not engaged in a nefarious purpose and they weren't there to mislead lead people. They were there to spread the truth for the uplifting of humanity and the, you know, saving of souls and so on. And in the 20th century, so it has a neutral, it starts because people are in the West, in the U.S. especially, are kind of anti-Catholic, the term propaganda itself in the 1800s has either a neutral meaning or a slightly Roman Catholic, you know, uh, meaning that is imbued with the prejudices that they had against the Catholic Church, you know, some, some which were grounded by the actions of the Catholic Church, which were not always so great. But it's not really until the 20th century that it has a very negative meaning, especially after World War One, World World War Two. Also, the Nazis, you know, they gave they gave it a bad name. But also, World War One, you had this massive propaganda campaign, and all throughout the 20, 1920s, yeah, the Creel Committee, which is the first, uh, the CPI, which is the first American official organization of propaganda, I believe. Uh, it yes. gets going during World War One. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I actually focus on this history in my book democracy in exile if anyone yeah. wants to check it out chapters two and three <laughs> the 1920s however because they are the propagandists in world war one are so successful and they create this cartoon version of world war one uh of the the hun as a rapacious you know sinister committer of you know unspeakable atrocities turns out not to really be true and so all throughout the 20s, there's a lot of a lot more anti-war sentiment. And it's it comes to be recognized that that they were the dupes of propagandists uh, for the on behalf of J.P. Morgan, et cetera, et cetera. Just very quickly, I just want to highlight that because I think this is oftentimes a, a criterion or demarcation point for propaganda is sort of the emotional intensity it's supposed to engender. Um, that's oftentimes how the early propaganda theorists of the 20s and the 30s distinguished it by by its sort of emotionists um, because they were worried about the, the masses, the demos, the public, right? And, and they were worried people like Walter Lippmann and even John Dewey were arguing that propaganda was incredibly effective because the masses were ignorant and foolish and that um, you were able to inspire, you know, 
irrationality in them, emotions in them. Um, so I actually think, ironically, viewing propaganda everywhere actually endorses sort of the anti-democratic politics of someone like Walter Lippmann. But I just wanted to, sorry to interrupt, but we're specifically talking about the 20s. So uh, that is that sort of, the, this is the, the major debate about propaganda in that decade. I, I urge people to check out uh, Walter Lippmann's um, and, and John Dewey's work, uh, Public Opinion and the Public and Its Problems, as well as Lippmann's also The Phantom Public. Yeah, and Lippmann was, I guess, a fallen socialist of sorts, and he ends up thinking that I describe you know, him as a liberal. I, I, I that, that, him as a liberal. He, he had previously, yeah, liberal would be accurate as, as by way of being a more disillusioned socialist, because at that point he's obviously not saying very socialist things when he's really talking about the hopelessness of the, uh, you know, the masses. So he seems to have become more jaded in some ways by by the time that he writes that, which is pretty early in his career. By the 20s, yeah. I think World War One. there was this popular argument, and I don't think it's accurate, but there was a popular argument amongst American liberals in the early 1920s that the reason the United States entered the war was because they were duped by British propaganda. And I actually think that that kind of ignores the material interests that engendered the war. But so I think these are complicated issues, but yeah. Very early, it became disillusioned. And the the merchants of, of war, you know, argument, and you, you saw lots of references to this, that the weapons makers made enormous amounts of money and that J.P. Morgan, House of Morgan, was connected very friendly to the British and they stood to lose a lot of money if the U.S. did not enter in the war. And in 1917, the Germans defeat the Russians and it looks like it could be a stalemate. And in that case, how's J.P. Morgan going to get paid? You know, and uh, this is, of course, a conundrum for the American establishment. And so all the propaganda, you know, forces are marshaled to get the U.S. into this into this war. But it, it, but in the 20s, people are kind of disgusted by it because it was a massive slaughter and really for whose benefit. Uh, and so one guy, Bernays, tries to write in 1928 a some propaganda entitled propaganda on behalf of propaganda as an enterprise. And he just makes an argument about it as being useful and that it's going to help to uplift society and that it's these techniques of, of mass persuasion are, are things people should systematically study and so on. Can and I just more, point out he's that it's corporate people to this argument. It's not a populist argument. Yeah, well, it's kind of funny that the, the, everyone always points to Bernays, the guy who made money, saying that propaganda uh, is, is effective, is the guy's like, oh, the guy, he's saying propaganda is effective. That's like pointing to Steve Jobs and saying Apple is the greatest company on earth. Uh, you know, he says it. I, I just think there's an irony there that, that people should take note of, because I think there's this appeal to Bernays, I guess, because of manufacturing consent. Um, the Chomsky co-authored book, and, and he's taken as his figure. But Bernays was just one of many, many figures at the time arguing similar things. I actually think, do you know Paul Lazarsfeld? I think he is a more important figure. He was at the Bureau of Applied Social Research at Columbia. He was an Austrian emigre, and he's really the guy who made propaganda and, and sort of mass marketing techniques quantitative. I think he's actually a more important figure um, because he he basically um, gives propaganda analysis a a scientistic a pseudo scientific vibe. Um, so I would I would uh, encourage people to read about Paul Lazarsfeld. I think he's more important than Bernays. So the argument that Bernays is putting forward that propaganda could be beneficial and, and so on and that people should study these things to allow for the sort of management of society by elites and he pretty much – is it's an argument for elite management of society. So it's an argument made pretty much for elites. And at the same time, this other book comes out in 1928 um, that's really about the war and all the propaganda and how, how damaging it was. It was called Falsehood in Wartime. And that one actually was aimed at the general public and it sold a lot more copies than Bernays um, and contributed to anti-war sentiment, uh, sentiment. You ultimately get the Kellogg-Briand Pact. And so propaganda becomes this term that is associated with uh, war propaganda and deceptions from powerful actors. The definition of propaganda, uh, one Oxford English Dictionary uh, definition is any association, systematic scheme, or concerted movement for the propagation of a particular doctrine or practice. So and that, that just—I just want to point out—that includes every form of political communication in human history. To me, that's well, not an especially useful definition. What's behind that definition? Campaigning, campaigning things. I mean, you could report on politics in a. I mean, there's a journalistic way in theory. I mean, of course, 
of those different biases. So, so yeah. the problem with that definition. So, what I think is behind that definition is that there, the people are assuming there's like a truth outside of ideology, right? That this is, and that's the fundamental problem. Um, everything that anyone does is informed by ideology. What that definition does is, like, in a very liberal way, ironically, assume that there's a truth out there to be grasped. But if you're like, I think, a socialist or someone on the left, you understand the importance of ideology and ideology critique. And so you appreciate that all forms of political communication contain ideological content, because how could they not? Because there is no, this is a philosophical point, there is no truth out there to be grasped. It's all intersubjective. There's no such thing as objective truth for the human mind. Well, to it. To a degree, there's going to be ide- things are going to be ideologically framed and and so on, and they're going to be a function of the society that you live on, the prevailing epistemologies and ideologies and all that. But that doesn't mean that speech that's intended to manipulate people consciously and formulate it as such or other you know types of communications are not to be distinguished by like there's something like journalism that can be imbued with propaganda or have a propaganda effect because of structural reasons or intentional reasons. But then there is the idea of like the investigative journalist as kind of the antithesis of the propagandist. It's a myth. I mean, I would point people to Sam Leibovic's free, free speech and unfree news, which just talks about the sort of development of the professionalization of the journalistic profession and sort of the, 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 I would say the fake um, utopia of, 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 quote unquote, objective journalism. I think that's actually done a lot of damage to reporting. Um, I think, you know, that allows a place like the New York Times to claim objectivity when it's really extraordinarily ideological, as everyone listening to this uh, is, is aware. And I think we need to be, a, I, I think we need to have a more sophisticated, sophisticated understanding of political communication that distinguishes between the various types of it. Right. Well, I mean, something like, uh, you know, is it propaganda or is it not propaganda? I mean, the black didn't the Black Panthers call some of their – didn't they actually have a propaganda position just sort of recognizing that, okay, we got to get our message out there and persuade people? That's where yeah, – My know, understanding, it's used on both the left and the right, yeah. Yeah, a concerted movement for the propagation of a particular doctrine or practice. So if if something like uh, Hollywood – okay, one of the recent things that we did on this podcast was interview Matthew Alfred, who's a co-producer of the movie Theaters of War, a documentary on the relationship between CIA – Hollywood and Pentagon, you know, and how much they influence scripts. So they have, they go up to and including like the recruits, that movie, the recruit with Colin uh, Farrell was the treatment for that was actually written by somebody in the CIA. So it, and that the only reason that we know that is because of some court proceedings that brought this out in a strange way. So by and large, we have really have no idea how much they are manipulating like Hollywood, for example, and by your definition of, of propaganda, which which you posted at some point as uh, communications knowingly intended to manipulate a viewer, listener, reader, etc., by speaking an untruth, then things like that would not be propaganda because it's you know. Well, I, I I would have to see the movie. I, I would guess the movie lies about things. Would be my guess. Well, but it's, it's fiction, so it's not meant to be a. Or, or just a, lies a about the experience, of. or distorts the experience to the degree where it does not reflect as much as one could intersubjectively determine accuracy. So they are the. But the, I think the also like they a bunch are manipulating of, Hollywood for propaganda purposes, but in ways that it's like it's art, so it's not. You know, well, they're manipulating you know, to spread an ideological story. message. Uh, well, so two things. I haven't seen the movie, so I can't comment on it. My guess is that it does exagger- significantly exaggerate or lie about what the CIA actually is or does. That would be my guess, thereby making it propaganda. Or if, like, let's say it just, you know, documentary style said what the, uh, what the CIA does, then I would say it's a form of ideological political communication, which is all for. But I cannot imagine this does not lie or exaggerate, this movie. I just well, get, like, you, flat it, out. You, you can always, there are other ways besides to manipulate audiences besides of outright. Course lying and i mean the fix something that is fiction if, if you could argue that it's the lie is the uh is somehow in the fictional the dramatization of it and it says something that's totally false or it can just be picking the parts that they want to see basically the issue right. which i thought at the time with the movie the recruit is that there's it, it's there's this scandal of this, this very bad guy who's up to some bad shit in the cia and it turns out that it's it's one bad apple, and then the the other good CIA guy has to, along with the 
the good people in the CIA have to like root out this bad guy. And that was why I thought at the time it was funny because it wasn't even that radical at the time. And I thought this is propaganda. Or at the very least that distorts how power actually works knowingly, right? That is a distortion of how power operates in the American state um, and how the CIA is held accountable. So I, yeah, I'm comfortable with calling that propaganda because ex exactly what you just described is a distortion and is a lie. <laughs> And we, we live in an ostensibly democratic society with public well, sovereignty in theory. I mean, <laughs> ostensibly, I say. And we have to figure out why we have a really minority rule in this country, a, a tiny economic elite that is able to befuddle the population. And, and you so think that's propaganda? Is, I think it is the cumulative effect of massive amounts of propaganda. I think there that's totally also, wrong. There's a supposedly left party in America that's the Democrats. And people yeah, I believe, believe that. that they are like a lot of, you know, a good portion of the population actually believes that they are on something that is the that is the political left. And this is uh, OK. This is the product of a lot of massive propaganda, because how, you know, this you have two parties controlled by a tiny economic elite that will go so far as to scuttle their most popular candidate for not for actually representing the, the voting base in, in his policies. And so this is a this is for one example of the achievements of the propaganda system in the United States. So I would say two things. I would say you are right in terms of uh, identifying propaganda as a cause of people associating the Democratic Party with something that's called the political left. I think if people were aware of the tradition, it doesn't quite make sense for the Democratic Party to be understood that way. Nevertheless, I think this is where you go wrong. Um, I don't think that is the primary cause of the depoliticization of the demos. I think the primary cause of the depoliticization of the demos is just the structure of the American state and where power is actually located. And the problem is by saying it's cause of propaganda, it's be caused by propaganda. Um, the solution then is get rid of the propaganda and the people will have power. Um, or the people will even be motivated to change things. And I just don't think that's right. I think it actually makes the, uh, the problem easier to solve than it actually is. I think the problem is twofold. One, like I just said, it's the structures of the state where decision making is by design cordoned off from not only the public, but from, uh, in many ways, Congress as well. And two, ideology, you know, the framing political communications of society, you know, what's understood as normal, what the people's assumptions about human nature, people's assumptions about, about how politics works um, is a major reason. Now, propaganda, I would say, plays a tertiary uh, role in maintaining that sort of hegemonic consensus and maintaining the American state. Um, but I would say it relies more on what you're implying, economic power, military power, uh, the use of coercion, the use of force, the use of ideology. Um, and I actually think the irony here, and I, I, I'm repeating this, but it's so crucial, is that by claiming that it's caused by propaganda, you're embracing a liberal position, not you, one, is embracing a liberal position that it claims against all historical evidence that rational exchange of ideas between equals, which don't actually exist, is the cause of political transformation. And I think that is a fundamental misconception about how power works in the United States. Well, or anywhere. I put it as propaganda being the the cause. It's more of a it's more symptomatic of the material imbalances in the in the, the the system, such that one side can issue enormous amounts of propaganda, or various. It's really one side, but it appears to be multi-sided, but really putting out different flavors of propaganda for people to choose, whether it's like Russiagate or QAnon or whatever. I mean, these are massive propaganda. So Russiagate is a propaganda campaign. I think that is a propaganda campaign. But the question is, why did people want to believe it? That's a perfect example. So why did people want to believe? Well, which people? And the, the, the Why did Hillary and the DNC... Payments the broad swath believe, versus why did uh you know right the broad swath American of Democratic or, Party right yeah. like I think because they didn't want it they didn't want to accept that their ideology had engendered what they considered to be the total failure of Donald Trump so they looked for an exit and it was provided in I agree a propaganda campaign ab about Russia but again I think that the impulse there the reason that people wanted to buy it was not because of necessarily Russia but because of their search to avoid responsibility for what they considered to be the existential threat of Donald Trump, 
right? It was the material cause of Trump's election. And it was their, you know, frankly, their own psychic unwillingness to admit to their absolute catastrophic failures, you know, their decades of failures that engendered the belief in the Russian propaganda campaign. So the Russian propaganda campaign in this model is a, is a superstructure that is uh, reflective of this base that I just spoke about. Well, the 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 public was the the Democratic partisans were bombarded with so much of this that to not believe it would have involved them suddenly really taking on a kind of pretty anti imperialist leftist cast of mind, which they obviously didn't have. They would have had they deployed a lot of resources on this, and for the Democratic p- people, the Democratic Party people to like have disregarded it, they would have had to come to the point of view where I am at, which is like okay. I need to learn, you know, I need to watch the news to see what the lies are. How are the intelligence agencies manipulating the discourse today, which is exactly what Russiagate really was. It was intelligence, uh, you know, in this case, it wasn't even the intelligence communities as a whole. You find out later it's a handpicked group of of a small number of agencies that that came up with all this bullshit. And uh, so it ends up being, you know, corresponds kind of to a cabal in some level, although we've never really had it fully fleshed out what happened, and that they come up with this story, and then the mass media being totally uh, unscrupulous just amplifies this message completely, and the, the Democratic base is not ready for that kind of critique, so they were suckers for it. Whether they want to believe it or not, like they, were, I think they you're, were, weren't ready to not believe it. I think you're putting too much power in the story and not enough power in what actually motivated the belief. I think if if we're focusing on critique and if we're serious about like changing things, then focusing too much on the story, I think, misses the forest for the trees um, because the forest is disillusionment and um, self-hate, I think, in a lot of cases and anxiety um, about what had they thought was some sort of utopia with Barack Obama being replaced by Donald Trump. And so what something was going to fill that psychic void. Uh, that that void that comes from inside. Yeah, without Russia Gate, without Russia Gate, what do they? What, what could it have? I, I mean, so. which is the reason why I think you get Russia Gate. But with, if you don't have Russia Gate, then how how is it going to be understood by these people that they that they lost? I think it could have been channeled in a variety of different ways. I, I haven't studied it, but I bet if you go, it'd be interesting to go back to the first like three months after Trump was elected and see the various stories that were being propagated in order to explain his victory. So there was the famous white working class one, right? That one got got a, a bunch of play in the first like six months. But soon thereafter, uh, it was I think it was easier to actually blame a foreign actor like Russia, which I agree was this, in this propaganda campaign. I, I mean, that was absolutely a, a, a lie about the, the, the sort of gigantic effects it had on the electoral outcome. It just didn't, you know? And so, yeah, that, that, that I think is a propaganda campaign. Um, but I think it's wrong to say that the reason people embrace that because the story was so compelling about Russia or because it was propaganda. It's I don't think that it was things. compelling, that it was overwhelming forced, that it was, that it was applied to them. It, when you stop to think about it, it didn't really make a whole lot of sense. But if you weren't, red pilled on the actual you know the way the mass media functions and the the intelligence agencies function you know i say red pilled like to to some healthy degree then you were kind of game for that but what i would put forward is without russia gate it it, it it calls into question the entire uh democratic party as it's currently constituted and and that that and that that's the problem and that that is the issue that they had to save the, the corporate why would the intelligence community save the ostensibly left-wing party? But it's because they are it's a it's essentially a one-party state as long as the Democrats are totally corporate controlled. But this was so humiliating that they had such low turnout, et cetera, from with this against Trump that Hillary was so unpopular, but they moved heaven and earth to nominate her and and disregard the more popular candidate, that you've got to save the corporate party. And so the way to do that is to distract away and blame it on some external actor and then you get this whole you know saga that also has the luxury of precluding detente with russia which a lot of the establishment is for i i think that um to correct me if i'm wrong but the implication is somehow that if if we expose this as a lie there would be some sort of change or am i wrong there i don't really know but i will say it's interesting that it still hasn't been re- acknowledged by the press like you, you say that exposing things doesn't seem to matter, but 
the establishment seems to think they matter a lot. Look at the way they still respond to like Oliver Stone's JFK or even with Russiagate having been debunked. And you'll still see like Rachel Maddow do Russiagate shit on, on MSNBC sometimes. It's, uh, it's well, at least her ratings are declining. I think the power of it, I think, I think it's a desperate move by the left liberal media. I think, I think uh, I, that's right. I wouldn't I even think call them the, there is no left liberal media except maybe democracy now uh, or something, but like MSNBC, I wouldn't even call them left liberal. They're more You're just liberal, yeah, centrist uh, liberal. I, I would ne- say neo liberal media or something. There. I mean, it's, I don't yeah, even... yeah, I, yeah, they're certainly neoliberal. That's for sure. I think, I think uh, both parties are neoliberal at this point. So yeah, at some point we're, we're distinguishing, you know, uh, on very minor levels. I agree with that. Um, but, but I think that that's mostly about a desperate move by whatever you want to call it, the liberal media, the mainstream liberal media to, uh, gin up anxiety amongst an ever older base of uh, of of viewers who are you know actually stopping uh stopping to watch I, it'd be interesting i wonder if russia gate in the long term actually did damage to someone like maddow because it was so obviously not the major cause of, of trump's victory that people might have actually uh left stopped watching her because my understanding last time i checked i think it was a few months ago their their ratings are significantly down um, which I think actually suggests what I was saying was true is that th- these 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 propaganda campaigns may be powerful for a time because they fulfill some sort of psychic or material need, but they're very hard to keep up over time, and, and usually they they switch to something else in order to defend the sort of material interests we're talking about. Yeah, I don't. I would guess that under a democratic presidency, it's going to be harder. I mean, Trump was a big ratings boost for these people, the Trump clown yeah, show. And so there's that, but there, it, it comes down to more than just ratings at these networks. I mean, they seem to have a, to be conscious of their propaganda function. For example, with MSNBC, they canceled Phil Donahue when he was the highest rated show that they had during the Iraq war, because he was skeptical of the Iraq war case. Jesse Ventura, they gave him a contract uh, to do a show, and then they found out he was against the Iraq War, so they never let him on the air, but they still kept paying him. And he would have been a very popular person. Uh, they fired um, Ed Schultz for covering Bernie Sanders, essentially, and he had to go to RT. Um, they fired even Jenk Uger, uh, because I guess he's the Young Turks are like three degrees to the left of MSNBC, and so that was just too much for MSNBC. They actually fired him and said, you're too anti-establishment, which is funny to me as someone who is you know considerably more anti-war than chank etc um and so the it, I, I think that they even know that it's not just about rating like they actually have a they're they're aware of their propaganda role beyond just the five filters of like what what chomsky says you're saying it's not as bad as chomsky says i'm actually saying it's worse than what chomsky says and that they're no, i'm not saying it's not as bad as chomsky says i'm saying chomsky let's not talk about chomsky i'm saying it's not useful to define every form of political communication as propaganda because for the reasons I stated, earlier. well, not every like every form of political like campaign messaging is propaganda. I would say you need to if you're trying to like explain what is the left as a you know historical ideological current in human civilization versus you know forces on the right or you know traditionalist hierarchical forces, etc. Like these are things that can be explained in a way that's not necessarily propagandistic, right? I mean. The perfect unbiased thing is, of course, impossible. But there's there's an there's the an ideal of journalism, and explaining things, even if you're going to adhere to some imperfect thing, that's not the same as like consciously formulating things to deliver to have an a, a so consciousness. That's that's the criterion then consciousness. Well, there's consciousness in terms of a propaganda campaign, but in something like what Herman and Chomsky were arguing, they were saying that the reason that it has this propagandistic effect is that there are these structural things that that are overdetermining in in terms of producing the output of the the networks. But then there's other things that are like more nefarious. I mean, why is democracy now, for example, always excited about humanitarian war they they don't interrogate these things especially under democrats like i remember their libyan war propaganda that they did um and the syrian thing the white helmets like these the white helmets are like a propaganda campaign and the places like democracy now uh eat that up and so the more mainstream sites they're not anti-war to begin with and you're anti-war you're supposedly anti-war prestige media if you want to call it that i mean they actually can hire people right uh democracy now 
And then why are they flacking for war? Why are they having these these ghouls on there like uh, Philip Roth of Human Rights Watch? You know, I mean, this is the this is another example of how devious the propaganda is. Now you have human rights organizations. But that isn't that ideology? Regularly. It's not ideology because they are per se their ideology is not something they would even state like they wouldn't like yeah but because but why is that not just ideology that's just they, they have particular they frame the world in a particular way uh, also i should say I, I i'm not familiar with democracy now I've, I've never really watched it so i'm just going to go i'm just going to assume what you're saying is accurate uh and then uh, but what you just described to me is just how ideological communication functions they they sort the facts on the ground that they get from the wire services or their reporters, they frame it in a particular way in order to promote a particular message. If we're going to define that act as propaganda, then every form of political communication is propaganda. And for what I said earlier, I think that actually misses what's really going on, which is an ideology that is very difficult to overcome. You can't persuade people out of ideology like you could persuade them if it was just propaganda. Ideology is much, much more difficult to overcome than a particular form of political communication that's that's distorting the truth, however defined. It's, but in the the democracy now case and the the nation on some issues too, like they they have their their ideology that they would that would be their ostensible ideology is not what gets put out on, on important issues. So for example, 1991, the nation publishes an editorial saying that there's, that the accusations of CIA involvement in the cocaine trade are, are baseless. It's, you know, and it's hard to, you can't rational, you can't really explain that away with reference to the nation's ostensible ideology, uh, you know, or why do they have, you these are, I mean, I think if we're going to, I mean, that's, that's, I've, to understand that moment, that editorial, it's a, it was an editorial like by the nation editorial board. Uh, I, I believe it like so. They posted it and it was Peter's explanation, Peter Dell Scott's explanation to me recently, because he was involved in the Kerry committee doing actual investigations with the Senate on that particular issue of the Contras and the drug traffic was that Victor Navasky essentially forced the editorial board to like accept this piece in in 1991 that denied that the CIA had any involvement and that it was just sort of crazy. So there's some story behind that. Okay. So, so there's some power and interest playing there, but in order to answer that question, I'd have to like know about what's going on at the nation in 1991. In in general, just look at the, look at the drug, the way that they handle those issues, like something like the nation, which is like, okay, on what issues do they actually drop the ball? And it's the, the, the wars, that are humanitarian packaged as humanitarian wars, but that are, that are you scratch away the surface and you can see the imperialism very easily. And the, the issue of uh, the, the intelligence agencies and drug trafficking, they tend to obscure that and the political assassinations, which, which none of the yeah, I mean, liberal imperialism has a, has a long, long history. You know, I think it actually liberalism and imperialism and particularly European expansion developed together. So it's not especially a surprise to me that, you know, a, a journal that adopts a liberal ideology, um, or at least the nation, um, you know, it's kind of straddles the border between left and liberal. Um, it's not a surprise to me that they would, you know, make arguments that liberals have been making since, you know, Benjamin Constant, or really he wasn't actually that bad, but someone like John Stuart Mill or Alexis de Tocqueville were making in, in the ni- middle of the 19th century. These are, it's, that's, that is just ideology. Uh, belief about what liberalism can do, what governments are, are capable of, uh, the importance of liberalism as a universalistic project. Um, these, these, that's profoundly ideological to me. Yeah. I, the only reason I know this, I'm writing like a big piece on Cold War liberalism. So I'm doing all the history of liberalism things. And this is, it's from the beginning, this liberal imperialism, from the very beginning, this maybe a, and, first, second generation. So I would say that this, this ideology of, I mean, again, it, it, they're, whatever their ideology is that they would uh, aspire to or espouse, you know, like they're supposed to be the ones digging up, you know, the dirt, they would be saying, Oh yes, we support muckraking and so on. Okay. Sure. But did they support <laughs> Gary Webb when he was doing his work? No, they didn't. And, and yeah, why? I mean, there's a to see an ideological screed on anything. He wasn't arguing it from a Marxist position. He actually went and talked to people that were in drug trafficking cartels. He talked to people in the, even had people in the CIA that had been involved there, approached him, you know, some anonymously and so on. And he was just a straight up journalist, investigative journalist. And so why, why did the nation have people like David Korn come out? And that's the other thing that I would get at is people like David Korn, Michael Iskoff, 
uh, Joseph Alsop, Catherine Graham, these journalists that have connections to the intelligence world and the, the national security state. I mean, Catherine Graham's husband, Phil Graham, his best friend was Frank Wisner, you know, the original Dirty yeah. Tricks guy. Wisner, I thought it's pronounced. It's, is it Wisner? I think it's, it's Wisner. Wisner. W-I-S-N-E-R. Uh, I think it's, it's not W. I E S? I no, I'm pretty sure it's just W I. I think. I, I think oh yeah, you're right. I was me. totally wrong. You're, so, you're totally right. Yeah. And they were best friends. I don't know and why he got that wrong. <laughs> LBJ said um, Catherine Graham is worth like two divisions, right? Talking about Vietnam, this, the the publisher of the Post, and she's supposed to be this crusader, right? Which is a joke in Underwater Gate. But it's like, so this is where I think it's even worse than what. You know, the propaganda model says it's like there's actually some people with agency that you don't know about that are there as well on top of it. And so this ideology of like liberalism and why is it why does it come this way to like ultimately try to save the legitimacy of the state on some issues? Because something like the Kennedy assassination, for example, is very delegitimizing. And it's notable that none of the major media outlets that have been around a long time have been very good on that, even though the public itself, like 1976, support for the Warren Commission goes to 8%, for example. So why is it across the political spectrum of the even left-wing media, they're so bad on that issue? Like the Nation publishes Max Holland, who got an award on the, on the JFK thing, who got an award from the CIA for being like a great writer. So I think this might be a big difference. I think you might think that the state is doing that because they're afraid of the public. And I think the state is doing that because they don't have to worry about the public. I think because power doesn't actually um, emanate from the public will in any way, shape or form, particularly uh, in the time you're talking about in the mid 1970s, which is after the establishment of the all volunteer force. And then elites began to realize it didn't actually need many people to fight America's wars. So I think the story of the last 70 years is actually in the, the, the making the public increasingly weak and attenuating any role it had in shaping government policy. Well, on purpose. Yeah, yeah on purpose. And, I and read about that in my book. Them yeah. and, and stupefying them as, as well. I mean, this is the, the general public is very unaware of the way things work. And they, so I, in terms of stupefaction... Mad. In I don't terms mean of stupid, like IQ wise, I, I know you don't mean that. Mis misinformed and disinformed, yeah. narcotizing. And, you mean basically narcotizing? I think that mesmerizing. That, there's a whole lot of ways you could say it. Yeah, I think that that's mostly due to like cheap calories and less due to political communication. I because ultimately I'm a materialist. Like I think material just flat out matters more causally in history than than ideas. But basically. one of the things that you can do with the material, I mean, this is the, you know, base superstructure, whatever, is if you have the materials, you can, you're going to be determining the cultural, you know, the, the organs of cultural transmission and so on and information, the way information is distributed. I mean, this is why, this is why, you know, you, you political scientists, you've read that is Theta Scotch Bowl. You don't typically have revolutions in places, even when things suck really bad, because unless there's like they're really they have state failure due to international conflict and so on, because the the powers that be can always come up with ways to inform the public a, a, about the worldview that they want them to have. And so this is a you know, this is a major problem. And we like to think liberalism supposedly thinks that there's this like free press and these liberal institutions that are interested in enlightenment values and the truth, getting at the truth and the search for the truth and the, the rational debate, but it doesn't end up happening that way. And I, for, for material reasons, the ideas that circulate are those that are agreeable or at least non-threatening to the, the status quo. And propaganda is a, is, a, is a consequence of that, and it also buttresses it. I mean, the, the level of political communication and the, the character of it is, you know, key there yeah yeah I, I i i don't deny that that happens sometimes i think it's just more um i'm i'm what i'm trying to stress i think is that if we want to think strategically i do notice on our side broadly speaking an obsession with propaganda and conspiracy and i think that is you know not not totally um um, not useful, um, but I think we ha we have to admit that we haven't done that well on the left, um, and I think we need to be thinking about where power lies and how to affect power and whether you know um, somehow transforming uh, American ideology how that would actually come about. And I don't think it would necessarily come about through the revelation of truth. I don't think that is accurate. Yeah, I, I don't think in and of itself 
it would be able to transform things because, well, I mean, but uh, and again, I, I do think that there's a, an amount of, when it comes down to it, they, there is a clandestine apparatus of the state. And so if the standard generic, ver- you know, methods of control don't work, then they'll kill someone. Malcolm X was not somebody who was extremely sanguine about life in America, famously. And he said towards the, you know, after visiting Mecca and kind of having a racial epiphany about, you know, the equality of, of people, he kind of dropped the white devil shtick from his repertoire. He said, you know, America maybe is the first country where there actually could be a peaceful revolution. He had that idea. Uh, and of course, you know, he gets assassinated uh, for his for his troubles, likely with by, with collusion from state elements. So there is that that part of it. But people have thought that. Now, I, I tend to think that having read Scotch Poll and looked at the long view of history, that a peaceful transformation through the revolution of revelation of truth is not maybe likely itself just to do anything, but in conjunction with a obvious decline of legitimacy based on real world material things like the, the fall of the U.S. empire, which seems inexorable. It seems like we go from one debacle to the next. The Afghanistan thing, we finally threw in the towel, although who knows what kind of mischief will perpetrate there. You had this Kazakhstan. Quite a bit, I would imagine. <laughs> Quite a bit. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. sure. But but I think they're going to be kind of limited ultimately in, in what they're going to be able to do. They're not going to have as many beachheads. So, I think the U.S. is, is going why... to from Kazakhstan. This, this debacle there where you have protests and then, oh, what's happened? How did these severed heads get on the ground? I don't know about that. I mean, the U.S. just totally, you know, uh, bungled that again, I, I would argue. I mean, it seems pretty clear to me that that was a color revolution slash violent coup that went wrong. And so what's going to happen when the U.S. is actually not able? I mean, are we going to blow the world up to try to stop it from happening? Are we going to provoke war in Ukraine or Taiwan and just so I think- knock everything over or what? <laughs> I think you're more sanguine about the decline of the empire. Um, I think the U.S. will be able to manage its empire for a, a long time uh, off of things like drone warfare and special forces. I, I agree. I don't think it will, will be um, because of China. I don't think it will be able to remain dominant in East Asia. But I do think for much of the world, the U.S. can still basically act as an imperial power far into the future. I think this was the um, innovation, if you're going to call it that, of the all-volunteer force. You know, the Vietnam protests forced the hand of the military state to be like, whoa, we can't rely on the bourgeoisie or really the working class to fight our wars in quite the same way any longer. So what we're going to do is shift. And uh, this is kind of the shift that that Sam Moyne partially charts in his book, Humane. We're going to shift to a, a low footprint warfare, you know, with drones and special forces and the projection of power through bases. And, and that's why I think that the U.S. will be able to maintain its empire for much longer. It's unique in history. Back in the day, you know, if there was delegitimization at home, you wouldn't literally have people to staff the military. But now with the advent of push button warfare, you don't need that many people to do it. And so that's why I actually think we're in a unique historical moment. And, and these are the sorts of questions about power and where power lies that we on the left need to be um, far more open to uh, and, and move beyond, I would say, frankly, the models of the 20th century, which don't reflect how power operates in the early 21st at all, um, in, in, in my opinion. <laughs> The U.S. seems to have to be losing these wars with the low footprint. I mean, in, and, and even our Doesn't proxy matter, wars, though. Yemen, it looks like they're not going to win in Yemen. They lost in Afghanistan. They just failed in Kazakhstan. The Ukraine totally. thing is a wash, but like, totally. the what's the U.S. going to do there? The, Russia, understandably so, does not want that to be a NATO country uh, and with nuclear missiles stationed there and, you know, it's. I don't know what they're going to do in Ukraine. The U.S. could start a war in Ukraine that would be a disaster, or potentially in Taiwan, if it would be a disaster. I don't think China was going to invade unannounced. But the you know the U.S. seems to be the Iraq war is a disaster. They want us to leave. My understanding is they asked after the U.S. just murdered Soleimani, I guess for the crime of defeating ISIS. And then Trump threatened to cut off their access, I think, to the Fed. So this is the thing. Like, I I totally agree. The U.S. has lost all of these things. Like, I I, I think it'd be it'd be. I cannot imagine how one could look at the last 20 years as anything but a series of disasters and lurching from failure to failure. But I think what we might begin 
to have to admit is that that doesn't really matter for the structure of the empire. It doesn't really matter for the budget. It doesn't really matter for the 750 uh, military bases. Until it does, though. This, until this, it does. Sure, this, until The it Middle does. East, the control, Agreed. oil, Europe, hanging in the Oil's balance. becoming less important, I think. Yeah, because, I, I think but if they Europe become less important, the then and then Latin America, the tra- I mean, the U.S. has spent a lot mm-hmm. of time vil- demonizing the governments in Venezuela and Nicaragua, and they're still there in Cuba, of course. Uh, Mexico has a slightly left of center government, but I don't know how long we'll tolerate that. Um, but like even in Latin America, Chile has a new constitution, elected a, a guy, you know, a, a liberal dude at least. Um, Brazil, they've look at all of the chic- chicanery yeah. they tried there. Boric and Lula in might jail. win. Yeah. yeah, Lula should win. So it, it seems like the uh, the it may come faster, and the aban- the dollar is what really allows the U.S. to go around acting like the global global bully and that may be changing soon i wrote an article about ending dollar hegemony but um from your from your lips to god's ears <laughs> may 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 the empire uh end sooner than i think it will i i hope it does and i hope it uh, doesn't take the rest of the world with it and uh, <laughs> Same <with> that, here. <laughs> uh we'll talk soon thanks so much aaron no problem bye-bye